Uh, Jack Schmidt. Jack Schmidt will be uh, back uh, to answer questions along with Art Robinson, but I want to bring back the MC for this afternoon. You'll remember he's the villain of the month, but a nice guy all the way around, Myron Ebel. Myron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the second astonishing individual it's my honor to introduce today is Arthur Robinson. He doesn't really want to be introduced, but I just want to say one or two things about him. He's a, he's a physical chemi chemist who got his PhD at Caltech, and he worked for a number of years on a very wide range of scientific research with Linus Pauling. And uh, there are two things about his career that really stand out. One is uh, he, has, he does have a very broad range, which I think, is, as Tim Ball has said, is really necessary if you're going to understand how the climate works. You have to not be a specialist, but a generalist. And the second thing is that he really is a maverick. Uh, not only, I think working with Linus Pauling uh, indicates that, but then he, he had a falling out with Linus Pauling over the role of vitamin C and, uh, uh, and became an independent scientist, which I think is a very admirable thing. He's often, uh, mar uh, people try to marginalize him by saying, oh, he's just working on his own. Well. Think of the scientists who did work on their own. Uh, think of Henry Cavendish, who went back to his house in London. Uh, think of Lavoisier. Think of Isaac Newton. Think of Charles Darwin. And uh, so he, he, I think he's uh, the most admirable kind of scientist. He's an independent scientist. So please join me in welcoming Art Robinson. Independent, but not in the class of those people he mentioned, obviously. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay. I'm going to talk uh, about this subject, the subject that all the speakers are talking about in various ways. But first, let's consider the problem we have, the real problem. The problem is, as you see from the pie chart, that America imports 30% of her energy. Now, why do we do that? Why don't we make our own? We have vast hydrocarbon resources, There's abs and they're all inter these hydrocarbons are interchangeable. There's no reason that we should do this. We invented the nuclear age, but we import 30% of our energy. And the reason for this is that over the last 30 or 40 years, we have allowed taxation, regulation, government-sponsored litigation, and other things in, in our political process to rise to the point where it is not sensible to produce energy in the United States. So we are largely left with the energy production that was created by free men before these things originated. 30 years ago or more, we cut off the development of our nuclear energy industry, and we have hobbled our hydrocarbon industry at every turn. Julian Simon pointed out that free men, on average, as a group, always produce more than they consume. So people become more prosperous, and humanity's condition improves. But there's a caveat. They must be free to produce. And if you take enough of their freedom away, then they don't produce. They don't produce more than they consume. And to a large extent, particularly in the case of energy and some of our other industries too, we're standing on the backs of free men who built these industries before us, and we haven't allowed these industries to progress. In the uh, next slide, I'm going just to just illustrate. Now, I don't in any way suggest that I know how our energy problem should be solved. I don't think anyone does. It should be solved by the free market. But here's an example of what could be done. Outside of Phoenix, there is the Palo Verde Nuclear Power Station. It has three reactors. It was intended to have 10, but it was built during the nuclear hysteria, and it was stopped at three. Each of those reactors powers a big turbine generator, one. It would not fit in this room. And that turbine generator generates twice the power of Hoover Dam. So what's left of Palo Verde, what they allowed them to build, the three reactors, are the equivalent of six Hoover Dams. And it's sited on a few hundred acres outside Phoenix. You barely notice it was there. If it had been completed, it'd have 10 reactors and would produce the power of 20 Hoover Dams. And if there were one nuclear power plant of that size in each state in the Union, Instead of importing 30% of our energy, 
we would have an excess of 20% of our energy to export. Now, you can build the same story about what could be done with our hydrocarbon resources. We have coal, oil, natural gas, methane clathrates if necessary. All of these things can be interconverted into one another, and we could be totally independent with hydrocarbon energy. But if our people were free and our industries were free of taxation and regulation and litigation, private enterprise would build these things automatically. The government wouldn't have to spend a cent. It would be better if they didn't. And we would have the energy we need and plenty for export. Instead, we have people who are telling us that we should dismantle the institution, the, the, the power generating capacity we have. They're lying to our people by saying this can be replaced by windmills and, you know, it's just nonsense. And I'm sure many speakers here have pointed this out. But they're saying we should dismantle our energy system in favor of a system in which taxation of energy and particularly rationing of energy becomes the rule. They have many spokesmen, but one of them has done us the favor of reducing things to very simple terms. And his descriptions are about the same as the fancy terms that are used by the fanciest scientists to work on this. So let's listen to him for a minute. Sorry. Al Gore, these are clips from his movie. In the first Here's a, what I think is a better explanation. His favorite explanation of global warming. Global warming or none like it hot. <laughs> You're probably wondering why your ice cream went away. Well, Susie, the culprit isn't foreigners, it's global warming. Global wapu? Yeah. Her ice cream is melting faster because of the one, five tenths of a degree centigrade per century rise in temperature. <laughs> the comparisons are made. You have a paper that we gave you as a handout that has these things. Uh, the explanation continues. He comes all the way from the sun to visit Earth. Hello, Earth. Just popping in to brighten your day. La, 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 la. And now, I'll be on my way. Not so fast, Sunbeam. We're greenhouse gases. You ain't going nowhere. Oh! Ah! Oh! Ah! Oh! Oh, God, it hurts! Pretty soon, Earth is chock full of sunbeams. They're rotting corpses heating our atmosphere. <laughs> He doesn't, he doesn't mention, doesn't mention to Susie that the, the little demons, mostly they're water molecules, a few carbon dioxide molecules, and if you add oxygen, they're the three substances that must be in the atmosphere for the existence of life. That's not mentioned to children. This is not a cartoon or a joke. This has been shown to tens of millions of American children, great ch school children. In this one, Al presents the CO2 rise levels. It just keeps going up. It is relentless. He doesn't like to label his axes, and in this case you can see why. The CO2 levels kind of go up from zero depending on what man did, but of course you know that it's a much 30 percent rise, and those are the real axes. This one. Here is what's been happening year by year to the Columbia Glacier. It just retreats every single year. Al only shows us the data from 1980 on. If he showed us the data for the last 200 years, the viewers of his movie could see the glaciers have been melting for 200 years, 100 years before man produced significant amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and the melting rate didn't change when man started to produce carbon dioxide in significant amounts. The next one. But there is one relationship that is far more powerful than all the others, and it is this. When there is more carbon dioxide, the temperature gets warmer because it traps more heat from the sun inside. The famous one, you know, the CO2 and the temperature correlate in the ice core data. And Al has this across a great big stage bigger than this, and he rides a little chair. The, what he neglects to mention is that this, if, if this data didn't look this way, we would know the ice cores were wrong because the vapor pressure of carbon dioxide is temperature dependent. 
You can take a flask in the laboratory, put seawater in it, dissolve carbon dioxide to the concentration that is present in the seas, gradually raise the temperature, and the vapor pressure, the amount of CO2 in the gas over the water will just go up and down exactly like this. Moreover, it's quantitative. In this bar graph, you see on the left the amount of temperature change correlated with 30 percent rise in CO2 average over all the ice core data. The second graph, the uh, second bar, is that estimated by Ravel and Seuss as to what would happen if it were just vapor pressure dependent. The third is the actual experimental data from a flask of that sort. The CO2 goes up and down because it's temperature dependent. It has to because of equilibrium thermodynamics. This has, it, Al essentially is saying the equivalent of uh, accidents cause speeding. And this one? This is the range that would be expected over the last 60 years. But the scientists who specialize in global warming have computer models that long ago predicted this range of temperature increase. Now I'll show you recently released the actual ocean temperatures. This one's my favorite. Play it again and stop it. This is the range that would be expected over the last 60 years. But the scientists who specialize in global warming have computer models that long ago predicted this range of temperature increase. That's the computer model predicted temperature range. Look closely. He did label the axis on this one. His computer model predictions began in 1938. Now, unless Big Al invented the computer before he was born, and didn't show it, didn't, didn't share it with anybody but climate modelers for the next 20 years, this isn't true. And of course it's not. The whole thing is a fabrication. There are no com such computer models. Next. We have seen uh, in the last couple of years a lot of big hurricanes. Hurricane Jeannie and Francis and Ivan uh, were among them. And of course the, the consequences were so horrendous. There are no words uh, to describe it. And as many of the speakers will point out, there's no correlation between the hurricanes and, and the hurricane, hurricane frequency and intensity has not increased during the period that man is producing hydrocarbon. Next. That's why the citizens of these Pacific nations have all had to evacuate to New Zealand. This is because they've been flooded off their Pacific islands by the three-inch increase in sea level over the last 50 years. There are a lot of vectors for infectious diseases that are worrisome to us that are also expanding their range, not only mosquitoes, but all of these others as well. Well, this is false. We don't need to go into each one, but the mosquitoes are interesting because Al Gore is a promoter of mosquitoes. He has been a very strong advocate of the continuation of the ban of DDT, which keeps half a billion people sick and kills two or three million children every year. This one. Overall, species loss is now occurring at a rate 1,000 times greater than the natural background rate. Notice the species that are disappearing, the woolly mammoth. We have here a, a scales that balances two different things. On one side, we have gold bars. Mmm, 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 don't they look good? I'd just like to have some of those gold bars. Mmm, mmm. On, uh, on the other side of the scales, uh, the entire planet. Now these gold bars, we're getting a little closer to the subject. I think Indiana Jones put it very well. One of his sidekicks says, why are they doing this, Indiana? And Indiana says, fortune and glory, kid, fortune and glory. And that's what Al Gore has gotten for his efforts, fortune and glory. A pile of gold bars that this guy has made by these statements that we've gone before, would, you wouldn't be able to see Al for the gold bars. And then uh, the last thing, I've given you a list of that little petition. Uh, we. Uh, got into this in an odd way because we wrote an editorial in the Wall Street Journal invited during the Kyoto meetings and were astonished when the enviros read us out of the human race. That got our attention and we circulated a petition. Many of you are signers. I won't go into it uh, extensively as to 
The text is there on the thing that I put on your chair and you understand it. Uh, this petition, of, in which has been signed by over 31,000 Americans with university degrees in science, 9,000 PhDs, uh, does not purport in any way to determine scientific truth. Scientific truth is not determined by polling. Human opinions cannot change natural truth. Scientists just seek natural truth. Their opinions are irrelevant. And oftentimes, many times in history, one man has been right about the science and all the rest wrong. There's no effort to determine what the truth is by polling. Our goal was solely to show that the consensus that Al Gore has been claiming for the last decade, saying that virtually all scientists agree with him except Richard Lindzen, whom they always bring out as the last skeptic, uh, is not true, that he has a lot of allies. Uh, it includes a couple of thousand people who could be said to be in climate science. Most of them are not climatologists. Climatology is a relatively small field. But again, as Professor Lindzen told us, this field is, has been, it's failing. It's in trouble. Because too many of the people in that field have succumbed to the search for fortune and glory, grants and notoriety, and too few are among the principal people uh, that are here today and, and, and elsewhere that have been able have held to their science. So it's completely appropriate when a small field of science is hijacked by politics, it's very appropriate for tens of thousands of physicists and chemists and astronomers and mathematicians to come to the rescue of that small field, to support the men who are still principled and to oppose those who are not. So it is correct this petition contains mostly, or to a large extent, scientists from other fields. What's at stake? There are several things at stake. This description by Al Gore, is, it, it's silly. It's just silly. It's not science. And the IPCC isn't any better. It's the same thing with more window dressing. And first, they wish to tax and ration our energy. And if there's one thing you can control human beings more effectively with than controlling their banking, you can control their energy. We've seen what can be done with banking. As the United States shipped more and more of its industry abroad, as we produced less and less energy, we had to import these things. And we traded our goods for the energy we needed abroad. Then we started to run out of things to trade. So we got a huge trade deficit. And we funded that with debt. And now we all see where that has gotten us. We don't, they won't take our debt anymore. Sometimes I say the end of this is outsourcing, to finish the outsourcing. We need to have the Chinese make our money. If they print our money, they can pay themselves and send us the goods. It's, it's <laughs> simple. But freedom, this is not a comment against the Chinese. They've made the goods. But the, our freedom and our prosperity depend upon winning this fight. These people not only do not want us to replace that 30% of energy that we are not producing, they want us to close our coal plants and produce no nuclear plants and make that pie get bigger and bigger and bigger. And first, of course, the cost of energy will go through the roof, and then we'll have rationing. And once they can ration our energy, our freedom is gone. But there are people who will suffer more. In our own society, those who are prosperous will be less prosperous. And those on the lower end of the economic ladder, those that politicians have been using to explain, to claim that they can you know, take the wealth of the wealthy and give it to them, those people will suffer the most because the marginal utility of their money is much less than those who are prosperous. But in the rest of the world, it means a lot more. We have one example of genocide by technology, by withdrawal of technology, and that is DDT. Even though the EPA's own scientific review board told them that they shouldn't ban it, there was a useful, harmless substance, even though it resulted in a Nobel Prize, even though the National Academy of Sciences said hundreds of millions of lives were saved by DDT, they banned it. And the United States agencies extended that ban through their power throughout the world. And the result has been 30 or 40 million children dead and over half a billion human beings sick at this time because of DDT-preventable malaria. This is technological genocide. It is genocide by withdrawal of technology. And now they've got something even better for the survivors. The third world 
the people, billions of people, who have been lifting themselves from poverty by the application of energy and technology. The technology and energy they have is just enough to provide them with food and shelter. They sit, they sit on the lowest ladder of human existence, and they're pulling themselves up into a better and better world. These people, if we're deprived of energy, will simply die, hundreds of millions of them. And we can't send them energy and not the United States. Energy is fungible. It tra travels throughout the world. If industrialized nations are restricted in their energy and their energy is rationed, those people are going to die in huge numbers, far beyond anything we've seen with DDT. And nor, nor was DDT an accident. Oh, yeah, we did something it didn't ac accidentally. We didn't know we'd kill all those people. I'm sorry. It went on year after year, decade after decade. And only now is beginning to stop largely because of the efforts of CORE, Paul Dreesen, and Roy Innes, who have uh, reversed this. Now, Jim Hansen has said that everyone who opposes the hypothesis human-caused global warming, a failed hypothesis, but everyone who opposes it, he said that we should all be tried for crimes against humanity. Jim sort of, you know who he is, he's sort of the Rasputin of the U.S. Congress. He appears, but really, uh, I think that he and Al Gore should look in the mirror if anyone's going to be talk about crimes against humanity because the restriction of humanity's energy supplies, regardless of how much the elite that promote this might benefit from rationing and controlling energy, the human effects and the human cost is enormous. The only solution to these problems is not some policy thing, it's not some little law we can pass, it's some, not some little fix you can make in what they're trying to do. The only solution to this is to give us our freedom back. The producers of the United States, the engineers and scientists in our generations who have the ab same abilities as the engineers and scientists in previous generations that built our petrochemical industries, that built our energy industries, that built the infrastructure that gives us our lives, the, the representatives of those people in our current generations must be freed from the taxation and regulation and litigation that they currently are suppressed by so that they can solve not only our energy problem but also our other problems in, uh, in economics. It's absolutely essential that these people be beaten. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves enslaved. There's no, uh, nothing but slavery ahead for those whose energy is rationed by others. So please, don't let them do it. Thank you.